<laughs> okay. Well, good morning. We've got uh, we've got three here in the room with me. We've got Miss Leona, we got Miss Marie, and we got Mr. Dan. We see your faces on the screen, so we know who's there. So we're glad to have everybody with us. As always, let's start with our with our prayer concerns. I'll share with you. I uh, communicated with Pete Beller uh, during this week, and we really, really, really need to keep Pete and Peggy in the center of our prayers. He's he said there are some very slight, slight signs of progress, but he was just the language he used tells me he's still a little bit hesitant to get too optimistic, but uh, just just kind of keep them keep them in your prayers. He's uh, had a rough what is it about nine months or a year yeah. that he's been he's been dealing with this. So, and he is so grateful for your prayers, cards, phone calls, and everything. So, if you want to reach out to him, I'm sure he and Peggy would just be delighted. So, who else? Who else do we need to have um, to be thinking about? Me. Um, I have a friend. Uh, sure. A friend from. Uh, first grade on um and he had just re well within the last six months he lost his wife rather suddenly oh, wow. yes well anyhow he, well he's an ex he's a he's a retired he's an ex-marine and he's doing what into i think to massage his grief he's running three miles a day and bicycling and all this kind of stuff and i just don't want him to uh kill himself doing it particularly sure. in the heat yes sure. yeah i mean he's tough he's he raised he got, was married he got joined he was uh, drafted into the marine corps during the vietnam war mm -hmm. and and he um never he never went overseas but he did was a trainer at in at camp pendleton and then uh -huh. he got married the marriage didn't succeed but he ended up with the custody of the two children and he raised, which was an unusual in the 1970s, but yeah, um, yeah uh, he raised these two daughters. I said that he said that was the happiest time in his life, and then he got married a few years ago to a younger woman, and uh, she just collapsed. She had an aortic aneurysm and um, died. Yeah. Uh, that, and that, I, it's hard to lose. It's hard to lose someone's spouse, particularly, mm -hmm. but when it's yeah. so unexpected like that. Thank mm -hmm. you, Ben. Okay. Harry, yeah. I wanted to, first of all, thank uh, Marie for bringing Esther Powell to our senior adult picnic on Thursday. It was the first time that we've been able to see Esther for quite some time, and she really was frail looking. Uh, so we certainly need to keep Esther in our prayers. Thank you. Has anyone heard from Helen White? Rhonda, have you heard talk with Helen, how she's doing? Not recently, but I need to follow up with her. I'll try doing that. Okay, that take that makes two of us. I do as well. So anyone else? Uh, we had an interesting experience yesterday. Um, you may or may not recall a uh, dear, dear friend, colleague, uh, of mine, Jim Sellers, who passed away early in the pandemic from, from COVID. Uh, his youngest son was married yesterday, married Mike Greco's youngest daughter. And at the reception last night, of course, you know, they have all of the, the different things going on and they have the toast to the bride and groom and all of this from the maid of honor, matron of honor, and blah, blah, blah. Well, Chris, who was the oldest son, was the best man, and so he gave the, the, the toast for, for Cam and uh, Nikki. And I was talking with Charlotte, Jim's widow, uh, before before the reception started, and she said, Chris has got to speak, and he's not, he's a little bit worried about what he's got to say. And I told her, and I said, you know, Jim was that way. He would just get all flustered and all out of, out of kilter before he had to teach. And he's a, he was a master teacher. But anyway, I would always get to him and say, Jim, just let it flow. And he would say, okay. And he'd go on and do it. It'd be great. 
So I saw Chris before, uh, before he had to speak and I told him that. And it was interesting because he stood up and it was almost like hearing Jim. He was, he was exactly the same thing. So, you know, you pick up blessings like that when you least, least expect them. And of course, Jim's presence was, as Kay said, was palpable. It, everybody felt it was there. But that was a real special, special moment. So, anyone else? Okay, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for being among us this morning. We thank you for not only your presence here today, but your abiding presence in our lives, every day of our lives. And we ask that you would help us to be mindful of that presence and to stay in close communion with you, not only as we seek your guidance, your leadership, your words and comfort, and your sense of hope that you bring to us, but as we work with you in the building of your kingdom, as we work with you in bringing hope and bringing uh, comfort to people who so desperately need it. Sometimes we feel so limited in our ability to do things and say the right things, but we know you're walking by our side, whispering with that still small voice in our ears. We are able to do that. And we give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for not only listening to us as we pray, but hearing us and hearing us in ways that we know that you then move forward through your Holy Spirit to answer those prayers. And so we intercede on behalf of all of those who are listed in our church bulletin today, those whom we've mentioned by name and those whom we bring to you in our hearts. We ask that your presence might be sufficient to give them hope, to give them encouragement, to give them that sense of peace just that comes from your presence. We pray for those who are literally putting their lives on the line in so many different ways as first responders and people in helping professions and healing professions. Be with them and give them comfort and speed, peace and encouragement as they continue this beautiful, wonderful work that they do so unselfishly. We thank you for our church. We thank you especially for uh, our leader, Kent. He's been such a special special person to all of us, not only in this fellowship, but also in our community. And we ask that you would be with him and Nancy as they go opening up the next page in their book of life. Be with us as we study because we're limited. Be with us as we study because we are eager to learn. Give us new thoughts, new ideas, and more importantly, new understandings, because through that understanding, we're then able to communicate those truths to others as we share with them and as we find words of comfort, encouragement, and hopefully salvation. So be with us as we worship, as we fellowship, as we pray, as we study. But as always, we ask that you would be with us as we go out into the world to be your church. And it's in Jesus' name that we lift this prayer. Amen. We're beginning a series of studies in the book of Psalms, which I love. I love. Many, many years ago, uh, there was a study, uh, Russell Gregory conducted it here, and it's a long time ago. And I thought it was one of the most amazing Bible studies that I've ever, ever, ever uh, been involved with. And in fact, I've still got the, the study guide, the book that he used for that. So when we come back to Psalms, they're, they're really, really special to me. And the one today is one that I have never really spent a whole lot of time in. I was familiar with it when I started planning for it, but it's not one of those that you just say, oh, mm -hmm, here it is again. But it's a beautiful psalm, and it has got some of the most uh, depth of meaning that I think I could find uh, that I sometimes overlook in the book. Have any of you, are any of you familiar with the uh, musical Cats? Well, it was one of the longest running. Yes. Uh, okay, Ben is. Uh, New London Theater, it was one of the longest running uh, productions there. In fact, that, that theater was built largely around that particular production. And it has enjoyed a very, very long period of production here in the United States and even as a movie. But it's a fantastic piece. Uh, some gorgeous, gorgeous music. Uh, that we know is so typical of <clears throat> the composer, Andrew Lloyd Webber. 
And so one of the premier, one of the pivoting songs in Cats is simply titled Memory. And the words are absolutely amazing and beautiful and coupled with the music. Uh, it, it's really great. I wish we could have time to, to really go into it, but I would encourage you to listen to it or just put in a search for memory <coughs> on YouTube and you'll get uh, a number of different uh, uh, artists who've actually performed it. But I wanted to share just some of the lyrics from that song because they're so, so, so very appropriate. The whole production, Weber based it on a book by T.S. Eliot. The title of the book is Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. It's a great book, it's beautiful poetry. It's great for children, particularly children oh, about seven or eight to about 11. We adults will enjoy it too, but it's, it really, really is good. It's almost, uh, almost Dr. Seussian in the way in which it sort of flows together. Listen to these words though. <clears throat> Turn your face to the moonlight. Let your memory lead you. Open up, enter in. If you find there the meaning of what happiness is, then a new life will begin. Memory, all alone in the moonlight, I can smile at the old days. Life was beautiful then. I remember the time I knew what happiness was. Let the memory live again. Daylight, I must wait for the sunrise. I must think of a new life and I mustn't give in. When the dawn comes, tonight will be a memory too. And then <clears throat> a new day will begin. So from this, we see that uh, you have to know the whole story, but uh, it really is speaking of this thing of the power of our memories. And as we think of memory, we always think that memory deals with the past, which is very true. But if we just limit our understanding to memory, to the past and don't look at some other aspects of it, we lose some opportunities to learn something. For example, on the one hand, if we just deal with the past, it can lead us to be despairing because we are always wanting to go back. I think every generation in human history has probably experienced the thing why can't we go back to the past? Life was better then. And I can recall mom and dad even at times making references to that kind of, oh, the old days were so much better. And so we find ourselves, I do, saying, gee whiz, even at the wedding reception last night, I thought, gosh, why don't they do wedding receptions like they used to? Petty Fours Punch, Cheese Straws and Mints. That's it. Cut the cake. Everybody go home. We were there for six hours. It was wonderful, but my goodness, why can't we do it like we used to? So we get sort of despairing when we get into that mode and let memories lead us back that kind of way. But we also have to recognize that memory also has the ability to give us hope. Think on that for a second. You know, the, the, the status of Christ's church today, not just this one, but I think all Christian churches, is such that it could be very despairing. Oh, I have memories of this sanctuary being so packed. We would have to bring in chairs and put them in the aisles. I can remember when we would have uh, 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 covered dish suppers here in the fellowship hall and we would have to set up tables in the conference room and the library, even one time over in the old in the education wing to accommodate everybody. And we say, why can't we go back to that? Or this church is doomed. There's no future for it. I suspect that if we could talk with those who have preceded us in this church and those who have preceded current members in all of Christ's churches, we would hear things about situations that the church seemed like it was about to die, but lo and behold, here it is. We're still there. 
Dan and I had conversations years ago in which I so brazenly said, I'm so worried about this church. I'm afraid in five years it's going to be gone. That's been about 10 years ago. We're still here. We're still strong. We're still serving God. And there's that sense of hope that God has helped us in the past. So why don't we expect him to help us in the present as well as the future? So we have to be careful. Memory can also be a prayer because we can take those precious memories and mold those in certain ways that they literally inform our relationship with God, particularly as we move from that understanding of the past to our more clear understanding of the present and the future. And that's particularly true when we deal with things that are spiritual. Because we become aware of and remind ourselves God's eternal nature. We may not persist, but God does and God will. But our psalmist here in Psalm 77 today is facing a difficult time. We don't really know exactly what it is. And allow me the convenience of just referring to the psalmist as he. More than likely it was a man who wrote, the, wrote this psalm, but it could just equally as well have been a woman. But just for convenience, I'm going to say he. All right. Like all children, adults cry out when times get really, really bad for us. We have a disagreement with a coworker, with a spouse, with a child, with someone, and we start arguing or we start trying to make our point and trying to make the other person understand. And as we do that, what happens is in those kinds of exchanges, our voices get louder and louder and louder. And our voices are getting louder because we think Marie's not listening to me. She's just completely shut me down. Maybe if I talk louder, that will get her attention. And maybe she will listen to what I'm saying. And so when we don't think we're being heard, we cry out. I can think of a few times in my life when, probably not to the degree of a psalmist, <clears throat> but I've cried out to God. I just found myself in a situation that I just came to the understanding for myself that God just was not even caring. God was nowhere around. And that's exactly what's happening here in the psalm. The interesting thing is one of the beautiful things, there's several different um, types of psalms in the book of Psalms or in the Psalter as it's called. But about 35% of them are categorized as laments as people expressing sadness, anger, frustration, all of these feelings that we have when things basically just are not going right for us. And so what can happen is we can get ourselves to a point where we feel guilty because we feel anger toward God. And then we might also feel guilty because it's at that point that we perhaps begin to even question our faith. And more importantly, and more scaring than that is, we begin to question God's faithfulness. So the psalmist is crying out. The Bible is an honest book. The Bible does not hold back <clears throat> any of the basic human emotions that happen in the course of the scriptures. And we see that so very clear in this psalm. Doesn't hide the troubles, doesn't hide anything about this pouring out of the soul that's occurring. We don't know what the situation was, but he says, when I was in distress, and this certainly refers to a personal state of distress, not a national state. In other words, he's not distressed because of, um, and we'll take our own present circumstances, the 
the stock market, stock markets in in the in the in the trash. Uh, political situations are bad. We got wars. We got people fighting. All of those. No, no, no. This is personal. This is all about him. This is something that he's dealing with. And in that dealing, the best thing he knows how to do is simply cry out. I can I can almost see this psalmist raising his hands and looking to the heavens and basically saying from the depths of his soul, God, where are you? Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you hear what I am trying to say? Why don't you help me? Why don't you take away this problem that I'm having to face? I don't know if you've read much of the writings of C.S. Lewis, but he experienced some very, very dark times in, in his journey moving from basically a, a pretty much out and out atheist to a very committed, confirmed, articulate Christian. At the loss of his life, of his wife who died shortly after he married, and he married later in life, his soul was absolutely torn apart. And in the middle of that grief experience for him, he reached such depths of despair that it was very difficult for him to even conceive of who God is and what is God doing or not doing. We've all been there, I'm sure. I have. We have those moments. We have those times. And I think I find comfort in knowing that God understands that. After all, he made us. But we get a little bit of a clue here of where the mind of this psalmist is, is moving and the direction it's beginning to take. And in verses five and six, it becomes very clear. It's sort of like the song memory. The psalmist begins to think about the old days, the way things used to be. And he says that in the old days, you were so present with me, God, that you brought me songs in the night. It's that sense of joy that is so peaceful, that is so calming, that we're able to sleep, that we're able to rest, that we're able to become refreshed, not only in body, but in mind and in soul. But he's not hearing that song in the night now. And he's frustrated. He's frustrated. He's got two problems. One is whatever the difficulty is, he's facing that serious trouble, if you will. The second one is his first step in beginning to question God. And I think we can understand um, completely that sort of tug and pull, if you will, between those two extremes, because it's sort of a battle with his own soul, trying to figure out what is going on here. So he asks questions. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject me forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? I think God would say, those are honest questions. I, I sense how you're feeling. I, I know. And we know God knows because on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had that sense of being absolutely, totally alone in the midst of a horrendous situation. We might all, we might, <clears throat> we might could paraphrase it by saying, in the past, God answered my cries. He gave me a song in the night, but today, what do I get? I hear nothing from him. Has God changed? And that's a very legitimate question. And it's a question that is quite frankly, very appropriate given the circumstances. Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Well, as the psalmist goes through this, he's answering the questions for himself. Because I mean, if you just think about the unfailing 
love of God. If you refer to the love of God as unfailing, it can't fail. There's something within you that says it's still there. It can't fail. But the mind kicks in and says, but I'm not seeing evidence of that. That's a great word. We've used it in this class before. I said, H-E-S-E-D. And it's hard to capture the meaning of that word in the English language because in truth, it actually encompasses almost a dozen different kinds of understandings. Faithful love, unfailing love, um, loving kindness, steadfast love. All of those terms come into play to sort of depict what this word has said truthfully, truthfully means. Behind, the idea behind all of that is that God has made promises. He made promises to the, to the Hebrews. And he was, one of those was that he would always be there for them. And of course, he demonstrated that time and time and time again as we read the Old Testament. He also promised that he was going to work through history to fulfill those promises that he has made. And then the real big promise was is that he would be faithful day after day, year after year, century after century, unfailing presence, unfailing love unfailing care. So the overriding question that the psalmist is asking, well, has that concern, has that unfailing love stopped? Do I believe God when I hear an answer, when I don't hear an answer? In the past, have I believed God because of his blessings? Now do I simply just believe God regardless of whether he is blessing me or not? Great story in the Old Testament. Real quickly. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Everybody knows the story, right? Three young men, three Hebrew men, and very faithful to God. They, are, they have been uh, put into exile by Nebuchadnezzar as he uh, overcame uh, Israel and uh, took took into uh, uh, took a bunch of folks out of Israel and put them in Babylon, and so he has confronted these three young men because they refused to bow down to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar himself worshipped, and that was the penalty that went for that was death, and it was even such a situation that Nebuchadnezzar says to these young men, what can God deliver? Uh, what God can deliver you out of my hand? There is no one stronger than me. What do you expect from a God? Is there one that can do it? I don't think so. And they could have caved in and bowed to that idol. I don't know that their lives would necessarily have been any better, but uh, they wouldn't have been thrown into a fiery furnace probably. But listen to their response. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. They could have taken the stance of the psalmist and said, God's deserted me. Why should I remain faithful? But for what reason do, do I need to remain faithful? He's not spoken to me. There's no evidence that he's given me. And these young men were pretty much in that same situation. They've been living a good life. And now all of a sudden they're put into a forced exile in a foreign country. And now they're about to be thrown into a furnace. God, where are you? They chose to believe that God was God. God will be faithful. God will be, pre be present regardless of my own personal circumstances. So the psalmist here has come to sort of a crossroad in his thinking and in his approach to his dilemma. 
And the question is basically a continuation of what we've just talked about. Has God's unfailing love actually failed? He can reject everything. He can say, yep, it's gone. End of story. Or he can say, yes, God is God and he does not change. His love, his care, his concern, all of those things are indeed never failing, steadfast. You can count on them. You can take it to the bank. Don't worry about it. So the psalmist makes a resolve. And his resolve is this. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. His emotions have been controlling him. His emotions have led his soul and his heart and his mind in a direction that was pushing him farther and farther away from God. And so now it's that same kind of thing that we experience where we sort of step back a little bit and allow our will and our intellect to sort of take over and say, now, wait a minute. As the scripture says, come, let us reason together. Let's think about this a little bit. In teaching graduate research classes over the years, one of the first things that I told my students was the fact that if you're going to be even a mediocre researcher, the very first thing that you start off with is start with what you know. What do I know? Now then, the researcher, once you know that, then the next question is, well, what else do I need to know in order to answer this question? And so the psalmist is right there at that point. Our prayers of supplication, those moments in which we just literally raise our hands and lift our eyes and, and open our souls to God and, and say, I can't handle this, God. You got to come in and help me here. And it's at that moment that we begin to recognize what God has done for us. Psalmist made a little bit of a mistake here. If you read the beginning of Psalm 77, everything's focused on him. Ah, me, my, poor me. It's like he's beating his chest and saying, oh, look what God has done for me. Look at this circumstance I find myself in. And God is nowhere around. Poor me. He's having what we used to call a pity party. And he's having it right there by himself. But what we have to do is start our prayer life by first of all, recognizing the faithfulness of God. The second thing we have to do is recognize the fact that God is in, indeed not powerless, but in fact, God is all powerful. We also then have to also recognize and tell God and, and understand what we already know. And when we begin to do that, we say, well, oh my goodness, we've been here before. He pulled us through it once before. All I have to do is be patient and it can happen again. And when those things happen, rather than being angry with God, we begin to praise God. So the psalmist has to begin with that point of looking at what he knows. What has God already done? Now, what he has to do is reach back to previous generations, for sure. But what he does, he sees that there's a long history of faithfulness on God's part over against a long history of unfaithfulness on the part of the people. So he says this, he gives four attributes of God. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God. You are the God who performs, <clears throat> oh, performs miracles, I'm sorry. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Look at these. First of all, God is holy. God is completely other. 
God is so far different from us as human beings for us to even make the assumption that we are as good or better is very, very foolish because God is, is God. <laughs> Enough said. God is great. All we have to do is look at what he has done. Start with the creation. Start with that creative experience and look at the love that comes out of what God was doing. At every step of the way, he said, that's good. And then when he created humankind, he said what? That's very good. That's very good. God's a redeemer. God is holy. He's set apart. He's powerful. He's mighty. And therefore, working with him and allowing him to lead us, we're going to achieve his purposes and ours. So this God is also a redeemer. This God is one who seeks to bring people to him, not push them away. God is the one who loves, the one who has come to seek and to save, as well as to serve. And we know all this because God reveals these things through what he does. He reveals it through the actions that he takes. And then the psalmist draws upon a story from the the Exodus that comes very close to the situation in which he is finding himself. The Hebrews were heading toward the Red Sea and then behind them were the most powerful army in the world at the time. They couldn't go forward, they couldn't go backward. And so they began to throw up their hands as they did so often during the Exodus experience and say, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Did you bring us here so that we could suffer death? Why, well, if we'd stayed in Egypt, we'd be alive. It wouldn't be a nice life necessarily, but we'd have a shelter, we'd have food, we'd have meaningful employment and all of these, but at least we'd be alive. They, like we, like the psalmist, in dire situations, we get so caught up in the present circumstances and in our present emotions that we don't even see what God is doing. We, we become, we, we turn our focus so inward, we, we can't see the bigger picture. In this instance, the Hebrews saw the Red Sea as a barrier. God saw it as an opportunity. And God acted upon that opportunity. And again, they could not see it. And it's interesting because when you read the scriptures, it, it's, it's an interesting take on the language that's occurring. On the one hand, you have Moses speaking to the Hebrews in which he says, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord that the Lord will bring you today. But then in the next verses, what happens is we see that Moses is talking directly to God and God directly to Moses. And he is crying out. Moses is crying out just exactly as this psalmist has been doing. And God then speaks just to Moses. Listen to what he says. Why are you crying out to me? Now that he's saying, oh, ye of little faith. Why are you crying out to me? And he tells Moses, he says, tell the sons of Israel, Go forward. Keep on moving. Have faith. Now let's look at the way the psalmist captures this, this event. The, right, the waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. What were they afraid of? Behind them, they had the Egypt, Egyptian. Boy, that's, a, that's, yeah, most powerful army in the world at the time, all coming after them with blood on their minds. 
ahead of them, they've got this boiling, turbulent sea. Most of them probably couldn't even swim. We don't know. But in any event, there's no way they're going to make it from dry land to dry land. Interesting thing is, look at the language that the psalmist uses. He gives it almost an what we call anthropomorphic, a human kind of perspective or identity. In other words, he describes a natural event as if, as if it had human characteristics. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. The key point, I think, right here in this lesson, in this psalm, is the very things that we fear, fear God. I like that. The very things that we fear, Fear God. Look at all the elements, rain, lightning, thunder, all of those things. And God says to Moses, tell him to keep moving. Your way was seen through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. They didn't see this ahead of time. Because their minds were focused on the fact that they were on their own, that God had deserted them, and Moses was pretty much right there with them. They saw a barrier again. God saw an opportunity. And that opportunity was to carry them right through the sea. We've been watching reruns of NCIS, Leroy Jethro Gibbs. And just it, interestingly, a couple of nights ago, we were on one of the episodes, I don't remember what it was, but they were in, a, one of the characters was in a real difficult time. And Jethro Gibbs says to the guy, listen, when you're in the middle of hell, keep walking. And that's exactly, that's exactly what, what is happening here. God is telling them, just keep moving. Tell the sons of Israel, Go forward. Don't stop. Don't yield. Don't give in. They could not tell that God was at work in the background because they were so focused on themselves. There's a great poem. I know you've all read it. I started to include it, but I know you're familiar with it. It's Footprints in the Sand. And the writer talks about uh, is doing exactly what the psalmist does. Uh, God, I walked the seashore in the midst of a very difficult time. It's done in poet, poetic form. But you were not there. Where were you? Why were you not there? There was only one set of footprints as I walked along and struggled with this problem. And God speaks and says, yes, my child, I was there. In those difficult times, I carried you on my shoulder. That's why there's only one set of footprints. And that's exactly what was happening here with the Hebrews facing the Red Sea and the army of Egypt. So how do we come to close this thing? I think first of all, is this notion of memory and the way in which we recall the good things, the positive things, the powerful things, the wonderful things that God has done. And those far outweigh those things that are in the immediate focus for us and seem to be just totally insurmountable. Listen to the psalmist. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples with your mighty arms. You have redeemed your people. And he knows he's part of that because his forebears were able to come through those difficult times because God led them. So a question that sometimes is asked, does God change? Or is it that those experiences that we're having and our perceptions of God change us? And how do we go about recognizing, knowing and understanding God, even in those very difficult times? 
I think perhaps unintentionally, because Trevor Nunn, who wrote the lyrics for the song Memory, uh, did not write this with any kinds of uh, religious or biblical undertones. I don't think that was the guiding point. There may have been, but I, I really don't think so. But I think that what he has done here is provided a secular perspective on a very, very sacred issue. And I think it's this issue of, does God remain faithful even in those difficult times? Go back to that open verse, memory, turn your face to the moonlight, let your memory lead you, open up, enter in. If you find there the meaning of what happiness is, then a new life will begin. God has always, in my opinion, my humble opinion, been trying to bring us back to Eden because he has always longed for that very special personal kind of communion, if you will, with humankind. And for some reason or other, we have sort of kept pushing him and pushing him away and uh, going seemingly in the opposite direction. But God is always there to redeem. And he's always there working for us to do it. So if we will just open our hearts and open our minds in those difficult times, oh yeah, we may say, God, where are you? That's a human reaction. But then in the depths of our souls, we reach down and we come back to that understanding. Yeah, yeah, it's a difficult time now. But think about what God has done in the past. Then those songs of joy come back. Those songs of peace come back and speak to us. And we know that not your will, God, not my will, but your will, God, will be the guiding force in this situation. And then we began that closer communion and what I refer to as the Edenic, Edenic, Edenic experience. And, and from my way of thinking, it doesn't get a whole lot better than that. That's all I've got this week. Anybody have any comments, rebuttals? Anything you'd like to say? If not, well, I would just say, hope you all have a wonderful week. Look forward to seeing you at the reception this afternoon for our brother Kent. And uh, we'll just keep moving forward. Love y'all. Be safe.